Hi, well, welcome today. I have Nicole Denimore, um here with me today. She's got a very interesting ESG-related practice, and I spoke with her a few weeks ago and thought she'd be a great guest to have on the show. So thanks, Nicole, for joining us today and for telling us a little bit about how you had this really interesting ESG journey. Totally. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, and since we're both laughing, I'll just tell you my last name is pronounced Denamer. Um, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, joining in from Seattle and just excited to have a chance to, to share a couple things with your audience. Thank you. Thank, thanks for coming, Denamer. <laughs> that, that, that makes sense. I kind of figured as much when I, when it's I all good. Your um, yeah, do you get that a lot? Do you get Denamer a lot or? I do. Well, um, so I'm originally from Wisconsin. And if you were going to pronounce my name probably correctly, it's very French Belgian. And so it would be Dana Moore or kind of some derivation of that. Because my family's from Wisconsin, the name's been Americanized. Uh, my family pronounces it Denamer. Um, okay. So that's kind oh, of it'd be like Denamer. Okay, something like that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's cool. So tell me a little bit about your practice and your journey towards this really interesting ESG niche that you've marked for yourself. Totally. Yeah. So um, I have kind of a winding road, uh, but I started my career uh, mostly litigating construction and insurance coverage matters here in the Seattle area, probably at firms that our market would consider about um, mid-size and did that for most of my career. So representing owners and um pretty big subs, public and private owners, um, got the chance to work on some really cool projects. And um, if you kind of took that maybe like 13 years and, and about halfway through um, was when I started to get really interested in lead and sustainable building. Um, my background, my undergrad degree is in environmental science. And so I've kind of always been an environmentalist. I also live you know, in Seattle very intentionally. I'm an outdoors person. I can see the Olympic Peninsula and um, from where I'm sitting right now. Um, and so kind of got really interested in the sustain sustainability or sustainable side of construction, um, which was very, very new at that time. And there was a lot of kind of chatter I'm going to generalize here for all the lawyers <laughs> uh, that sustainability or sustainable building or things like lead was maybe a little bit too risky. Um, and the environmentalist in me really wanted to kind of flip that narrative and be a positive voice or an advocate for sustainable design. And so got really interested in that. And like a lot of folks do started doing like really short speaking engagements and like little articles to just kind of like test the waters and see, see how it landed. Can and, I ask, what was the argument yeah. that lead building was risky? Or was, oh, I would, I, I could <clears throat> see some type of argument along the lines of it's more costly than necessary, but risky right. wasn't the easy word, so I'm curious. There what, was a, what is usually the counter argument to sustainable building? Yeah, back then it was, uh, there was a couple of things. One was that just that it was new and, um, Anything new, I think people, particularly lawyers, like to, to tag risk onto. Yep. Um, I, I could say a lot of things about that, um, and we can get into that. But And then I think the second most common argument I heard was that, you know, LEED in particular, and there are other third-party certification programs, and if folks aren't familiar with LEED, it's Leadership in leadership and Energy and Environmental Design. It's probably the most common third-party certification program with respect to buildings. And um, it was the idea that that interjects a third party into the construction contract and setup, right? So you've usually got owner, architect, contractor, subcontractors, insurance companies, all that kind of stuff. And now we were having this third party that no one had control over who was really, you know, the, the sustainability of the project was hinging on whether or not they certified it. And so there was kind I of- I see, so that adds an element of risk to your project. So for some yep. reason you might have disputes that arise because of lead certification issues, whereas you couldn't have those disputes. But for that. Yep, because we also saw a lot of um, things that we would not call best practice now, which would be like guaranteeing certification, um, being kind of loose with language about what, what green, which was a term we don't like to use too much, uh, meant, um, and things like that. So a lot of lessons learned since that time, um, but there was definitely some, some arguments with respect to risk that um, I personally don't think helped move the climate needle where we needed to go and in fact kind of stalled out a lot of projects that we could have uh, built back then that would be now you know kind of positively benefiting the climate conversation and things like ESG uh, but here we are and um, we kind of move forward from there. It's an interesting uh, point that you, that you made that I want to circle back to that there's a tendency in the legal industry to be as conservative as possible with your legal yep. advice and and to, and 
you know, you don't necessarily want to be an advocate for responsible business conduct, but rather it's, it is important to give your clients the best set of advice. So if you're working with clients and you know that that's an interest of them, you can, you should be able to give them that option while still, you know, balancing being a conservative, you know, risk calculator on behalf of your client, right? I think that's right. And I think the risk analysis kind of construct has significantly changed given climate change. And if you're not taking that into account um, in your advice, uh, you're doing your clients a disservice. And I see a lot of folks folks doing that. And that kind of relates to broader conversations around ESG, which I consider just good risk management or the cost of doing business in the modern world. So if you're not explaining to your clients how their environmental impacts are going to impact their ability to uh, get future work because it is going to be regulated or manage kind of some of the supply chain issues that are being driven by climate change and other issues um, or how they're like maybe really terrible social practices are not getting them where they need to go. Um, I think you're, I don't want to throw out standard of care language here, but getting pretty close to those things. Um, and so this idea that risk stalls innovation in a time we get on a soapbox here for a minute, but um, when we desperately need innovation, particularly in the context of climate change, um, I think that's that's something we need to take a closer look at and really think about. The climate crisis is urgent, and its and its impacts are disproportionate, severely disproportionate. And so, how can we, as lawyers and advocates, be um, giving our clients solid, competent advice? And I think it has to include those types of things and, and rethinking the way that we uh, conceptualize risk. Mm-hmm. I mean, insurance insurance is a great example. I mean, going around about that but <laughs> oh god I don't, I don't want to go go down that rabbit hole to be honest all right um, <laughs> fair enough one thing one thing i wanted to come back to is um we met because of my involvement with the model contract clause project mm-hmm. and some of our contacts who are just interested in how contracts can be used as a force for shaping kind of public policy going forward and it's a real key tool of lawyers and maybe you could tell me a little bit more about the contractual tools that you see are relevant in this kind of green building space i think you alluded to a couple of them um yeah and so for the you know 15 lawyers out there who are interested in these let's go i mean there's like 16 but um there's gonna be more because regulation is driving these conversations right so the um, the biggest way that contracts touch touch my work is I uh, sort of alluded to this, but like everybody has their own slice of sustainability, and mine is very building focused, right? And so um, leases are one of the major contractual agreements that um, that I work on and that relate to climate work as well as other contracts that relate to supply chain stuff. One thing, maybe we could take a step back and you could tell the audience a bit about the work you're doing now at the firm you're at now. I believe you started your own firm. You could just give us that background and then maybe we'll get a little bit deeper into the kind of contractual. Maybe that's on on me first. I should have asked you a bit more background before digging into into the weeds of it. It's all good. Um, yeah, so I own a climate focused law firm called Climate Aligned Law based here in Seattle. And I did that, like I said, after practicing for quite some time. I'm also a sustainability consultant. I have a separate consulting company that does that kind of work, uh, but just staying focused on climate line law for a minute. Um, I developed and opened this firm um, because in Washington state and other states, uh, we are seeing building performance standards um, implemented pretty quickly. And for those who, folks who don't know what that is, um, we have lots of ways that we can make buildings more efficient and buildings are a huge um, draw from the from a climate perspective. There's lots of opportunity in buildings to make them perform better, depending on what data you look like. Most numbers that people like me point to is about 40% of global climate emissions. So there's lots of opportunity in buildings to, to help them do better. Um, in particular- Sorry, sorry I gotta ask. So yeah. 40% of global emissions are caused by poor standards or we could meet 40% of our emissions targets by dealing with buildings? Yep. So, um, so again, the data varies based on what you're looking at and yeah. someone's going to pick this apart. But generally yeah. speaking, people like me say the building sector, so design, construction, the materials that go into buildings, the operations account for about 40 percent of global climate emissions. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah. You That's would think se- manufacturing, yeah. transportation would be a lot higher. They're up there too. Um, yeah. And again, it depends on where you're looking yeah. <laughs> in different geographic yeah. areas. Yeah. The point is that there's a lot of opportunity in buildings um, and from both how they're operated, right? Which means like how energy efficient are they? What sorts of energy sources are going into them and powering them? 
And um, what types of materials do we put in those buildings? That's generally called embodied carbon and looking at lower embodied carbon materials, things like substituting um, concrete and steel for mass timber. And that's a that's a whole nother conversation that could take up days. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, so there's opportunity in buildings. And in particular, there's a new regulatory tool in the market called building performance or building emission standards. And what those aim to do is take existing buildings. So I can actually see downtown Seattle from where I'm sitting. So if you look at any major uh, urban area, there are lots of existing buildings out there that at one point went through a code cycle, maybe a couple of times where they had to have some energy upgrades or something like that. For the most part, they're just sitting there dragging on the climate bottom line. And so building performance standards look at these buildings and say, okay, we can build these shiny new construction. We can up our energy codes and new buildings get built pretty efficiently to operate pretty efficiently. But these existing buildings are just out there and there's no incentive or reason for owners to, to um, upgrade them, particularly in a market like now, we're having this return to office conversation, lots of buildings are empty, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna use a regulatory tool, these emissions and performance standards and say, um, we're gonna set targets. They're usually uh, EUI, energy use intensity or some other um, emissions target for existing buildings based on square footage. And they have to hit those targets at a certain period in time or penalties are attached to non-compliance. This is a broad overgeneralization of how these things work. Yeah, yeah, uh, but folks aren't familiar. Um, cities like, uh, or states like Washington, um, New York has local law 97. There's different municipalities that have implemented them. They're kind of popular California? all over the country. Um, uh, in not, California, maybe not statewide, but perhaps in some localities. I believe some various local jurisdictions do. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, no, don't one. worry. Don't um, worry. We, I think we have a general disclaimer that you're obviously not providing. <laughs> Certainly no, I'm not. <laughs> yes, that and um, these things are also changing so quickly. Cities are like the city of Seattle just implemented its, so we already have a Washington standard. The city of Seattle implemented its own standard in mid December. So these are being implemented so quickly that it is difficult to keep up. Just as an aside, what I yeah. really love about uh, this, this series is a lot of it is talking about how there's the evolution from CSR to ESG, you know? Yep. And then to regulated regulated companies and really how nowadays you, you're advising these companies on responsible business conduct, not because it's something that they should do, it's because it's something that they have to do. That's where it really does implicate lawyers because not because five years ago, it was as part of your general risk management, you should be able to implement these policies. Now yeah. it's this law requires you to do so. So I have to be an expert in this law and an expert in how you navigate that legal landscape. So really great that you can that you have hard law that you're helping companies address totally it is nice because in sustainability you know we constantly make the argument you should do this because it's the right thing to do and unfortunately that just doesn't resonate um and that's yeah. too bad but that's that's for other people to work out not me um yeah. but right so we do have these new regulatory tools that are out there and um what is kind of from a legal, like, you know, nerd standpoint is there's no precedent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, the only precedent that I can look to here in Washington state is kind of the cities or municipalities that are like a year or two ahead of us. Denver's a little bit ahead of us, Colorado, as I mentioned, local law 97 in New York. Um, but there's no, like, this is a completely new regulatory tool, which makes it kind of cool and fun. And also, like you said, I really appreciate that that shift and that gets to kind of lawyer's role. And I, I know we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, sustainability has been this very like some generalizations and stereotypes here, but they're for purposes of making a point, kind of this like free hugger, philanthropic driven, you know, CSR, mm. all great things, um, but moving into this very highly regulated and very technical space. And that's why I think people like me, who I've been working in sustainability for a really long time, I've also been a lawyer, but um, you know, you need people with these kind of technical skills, as well as this kind of uh, understanding of how a new type of legislation, like these building performance standards might actually um, shake out, even though we don't have like lots of case law we can look to or anything like that. Um, but with respect to the contractual mechanisms, right? So we have buildings that all of a sudden now have to perform at a certain efficiency level. I'm just using this for oversimplification, yep. right? Um, at a certain moment in time, or there are like real monetary penalties that are high enough that they're designed to avoid the situation where someone might just pay the penalty as opposed to doing the building upgrades, which is how you get to compliance. So that could be things like improving the building envelope, which is all the insulation, all the stuff. 
um, energy sources, getting rid of old boilers, uh, all kinds of different, you know, technical strategy. So just, that also I, just, out, of curio yeah. just out of curiosity, when does this, when does the law and then really the penalties come into effect? Do they give the, the these this is five years? Or? Yeah, it depends on how it's written, how the law is written. What is interesting is that building performance standards are not standardized. So the law here in Washington, for example, is different than the law in New York. There's obviously common denominators um, and kind of a common structure. Um, but usually there's a lead time and it starts with the largest um, buildings by square foot, right? Because those are yeah. the largest climate draw. Yeah. You know, climate contributors. Um, yeah, Contr contributors. Contributors, uh, so like, for example, here in Washington state, we're starting with buildings 220,000 square feet or larger. So pretty big. Um, and those compliance deadlines are out a couple of years to give owners time to do the upgrades they need to do, look for financing incentives. IRA has some opportunities as well as kind of like local things. There's financing and other ways that um, tools that can be accessed to do the upgrades that need to be done, but there will be costs associated with compliance. Um, but cost of climate change you don't need me to explain this probably to your audience because they're here right so um so so there's that um and then from a from a contractual standpoint um how, because buildings now have to perform at a certain level you know someone owns a building but there's lots of tenants in those buildings usually right again if you look at like a downtown urban area multi-tenant buildings and we're talking about commercial spaces first this also applies to things like apartment buildings multi-family like i live in um all those tenants have to be working together with their owners to manage their energy use. Because you can imagine if you own a building and you had tenants who could just like leave the lights on all day, use 10 monitors each, uh, we're doing a bunch of you know gaming or really energy heavy things, um, you would wanna make sure you understood that, right? And, and set an energy budget. And so we can use leases as the contracts that govern the relationship between owners and tenants to, to help manage this new regulatory landscape that's out there. Um, and so maybe I'll just like pause there for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so I've I've got one question with respect to does the law look at kind of a building's performance or a building's capabilities? So if it's I think capabilities are well as long as it's insulated or it's LEED certified or whatever that's one thing. Whereas performance is more what are the tenants actually doing in the building? So irrespective of its kind of capabilities to be energy uh, conserved conservative do its tenants you know use use the premises in such a way so that you lose all of the energy savings so i think that's kind of getting into what you were talking about with respect to lease agreements yeah, yeah generally speaking the the standards will account for how what i would call project type right so like a school versus retail um or like a, even like a gym versus a library um they're all written kind of differently um but those energy use intensity targets are set based a little bit on the the use of the building, right? Because we're not going to have to kind of be comparing apples to apples okay. um, and, that, and that type of thing. Um, they do, as I said, very kind of widely. <laughs> and, and, and the two kind of contracts that, that come up in a, a lot in your work in the context yeah. of this is probably is lease agreements. So between lessor, lessee, so this, these are the people who are in the building and then construction agreements, you know, the the owner of the project and the, the contractor, right? Is that probably the two things you work on most frequently? Yeah, mostly leases. Um, I would say the owner or contractor, like how buildings are actually built, um, that's sort of a different um, space. And most of that relates to embodied carbon, right? How much carbon is going to go into the project and be what the contractor is going to use. Um, higher and lower embodied carbon materials. Oh, really? Um, I, I thought it would be more, I thought a lot of the focus in this space might be on, you know, like lead standards that, that the building needs to be. But you're saying it's all, the construction agreements also kind of try to deal with the amount of carbon that's used during the process. They really? should. Um, and <laughs> they should, and we're talking about, you know, I realize that a lot of people associate things like lead and there are, we're, we're using one example. There are other third-party certification standards, like on the well, uh, I work on the well building standard, there's fit well, there's eco districts, there's all kinds of different things. Um, mm -hmm. those have different foci, right? Like lead does look at energy performance perhaps in a different way than um, you know, a building performance standard does. And also because LEED is generally for new construction and generally speaking, yeah. and something like a building performance standard takes a building that's been out there for 10, 15, 20 years and says, okay, now you've got to upgrade to get here. 
Um, so these are all kinds of different tools, but yes, construction contracts should start looking at embodied carbon. And you mentioned the Chancery Lane project earlier. Um, and I was part of the, the team that's transposing those clauses from uh, where they sit to US relevance and the embodied carbon and construction clause and an embodied carbon budget was the one that I worked on and named after my rescue dog, but. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could just tell the audience about the Chancery Lane project if you like. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and you jump in I'm if sure I... Talk to, I'm sure you and I have talked about it before. I'm sure I've talked <laughs> yeah. about it on this series several times, but... How, how I would explain it <laughs> is as follows. There are a series of model clauses that are um, out there that were developed in the UK. Sorry, yeah, the, yeah. Chancery yeah. Lane. It's a very UK Thank sounding you. name, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's lawyers out of the Chancery Lane. Uh, I need some more coffee, but uh, yes, and um, that I relates to- I worked for British law firm for nearly a decade, so I'm kind of used to the English <laughs> file. I, I did not. So, uh, but these these model clauses uh, relate to a variety of different industries and applications. So for example, like I'm very focused on the real estate and construction clauses, but they have other supply chain um, and a bunch of ones that I probably couldn't name off the top of my head. Um, it, 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 it started off with just a few, uh, a few types of contracts where they were trying to implement kind of environmental standards into traditional commercial contracts. And then it's, and then it's just grown and evolved into coming up with all of these d different distinct niches where there might be environmental standards. And they've yep. reached out to experts on all of these different areas. And so, you know, not to, to I'll, I'll toot your home for you. You're obviously one of okay. the few experts <laughs> that does, you know, this kind of green certifications within these contractual frameworks. And so they naturally reached out to you. I'll take that. Um, yeah, and, and, and I would say embodied carbon in the U.S. is a very sophisticated market. Um, we are doing pretty well on that as opposed to the u.s maybe not being a leader on some other issues um so it's maybe tell us about, you know i'm not I, to be honest i'm not really that proficient i don't really know what embodied carbon is or, or yep. tell me a little bit about what embodied carbon is and maybe why we're leaders in that space in the u.s yeah and i can even tie we're not that leading back to in a lot of issues we're not uh, i can even tie that back to leases but let me make sure i make sure right. we under explain the chancery lane project though did we answer your question there with this so these model clauses that you can go online if you're watching this and and use them for free there's also some kind of commentary about the context in which they should be used or considerations that you should think about um there's some great definitions that are helpful so you can, you can go online and look those up i actually ran into chancery lane project because um salesforce used um, mm -hmm. some of their model language in their sustainability exhibit which yep. i think is a really helpful example for supply folks working on supply chain stuff yep. supply chain comes up in in leases and the other work that i do um and, yeah, and, and salesforce put out their exhibit um yep for free as well. So that that's a tool that you can use. Obviously, the amount of contract clauses are tools, the chance yep. clauses are tools. These are tools. These the whole idea is to help lawyers who aren't steeped in these issues have tools that they can refer to. Yeah. And they are free. And so free. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, but yes, yeah, so to answer your question about a body carbon. So again, when we think about buildings and their climate impact, you can think about how they're operated. I'm doing like this because I try to picture a building, right? And <laughs> so that means like how efficient is the um, energy source that you're using? How does the building like have these single pane windows that are just leaking, uh, you know, heat out to the outside, or really dated HVAC systems that are not very efficient? Things like that. So there's you're reminding me of my father admonishing me for trying to heat the outside in the middle. Yeah, of don't do that. <laughs> it's not, the door not open. Great you're, you're heating the outside. Not a great climate strategy. Um, but so there's lots of different ways we can think about how buildings are operated. We call that operational carbon, right? And that could mean like cleaner energy sources, things like that. And then the second kind of piece or conversation around buildings and climate work is embodied carbon. And again, that's all of the carbon that it takes to extract, manufacture, uh, and place all of the items. Like I'm, you know, I said there's some, oh, you know, some wood paneling behind me and drywall and um, things like that there's carbon associated with all of that, right? You can imagine all the shipping and that's why we look at, you know, things like local materials that are not shipped as far. We look at also just like lower embodied, um, like you can make concrete mixes, you can change the mix and reduce the carbon impacts of this huge building product, right? And then we also have broader conversations around things, like I said, mentioned earlier of moving sort of away from concrete and steel, which is very carbon intense products to things like, 
mass timber, which is a renewable resource. Nobody likes to cut down trees, but we need to kind of mind shift around from a carbon perspective, that's a renewable resource, much more carbon friendly, et cetera. So we look at embodied carbon of buildings uh, in addition to operational carbon, um, which definitely led the conversation. We looked at building efficiency and LEED and other programs really drove that conversation. Uh, city or county state energy code also really drives those things. Um, so that's something we're working on. And then embodied carbon is the other thing. So this shows up in things like leases, um, because one example of a way that we can use leases, not only as a tool to govern how owners and tenants that relationship, but also to the point of this show, um, drive broader ESG goals is by, for example, you could have a lease clause that set uh, embodied carbon budget for a major tenant improvement. So if you had a tenant coming in, maybe they were gonna rent like 10 floors of a 70 story building, and they were just gonna like blow out and demo everything. And that's just a lot of wasted carbon, right? And they were gonna like build all this new stuff that was basically the same as the old stuff, um, but just the way that they wanted it, right? We can discourage that type of behavior and instead encourage uh, reducing the embodied carbon impacts of something like a TI through a lease that says, hey, if you're gonna do a TI, uh, here's your embodied carbon budget, you can put it on a square foot or some other type of basis and get a, a get a handle on, on those types of, of aspects. And a lot of um, times, not only operational carbon, but also embodied carbon um, is a part of ESG frameworks and even um, ESG I mean, frameworks, we are so rich with them here. Um, mm -hmm. Like GRESB, if folks haven't heard of GRESB, it is the ESG framework that relates to real estate and real estate portfolios. Um, it recognizes things like green leases um, as as you can get points for that under their system. And so there's definitely connections between this whole kind of contractual dynamic, um, just how you're operating maybe from a building performance standard, state, local law, and then also broader ESG goals. So my practice is kind of not only looking at like, are you compliance with these new regulatory tools to the extent we can kind of understand what they are knowing that there's not a lot of precedent, but also, okay, if you have a portfolio of multiple buildings, particularly if they're across jurisdictions, how do we make those assets support your ESG program to the extent that we can? Leases is one tool. Um, there's also like supply chain contracts. And then we get into issues like SB 253 in California and kind of those- um, The reporting clim frames. yeah. Climate disclosure laws, yeah, mm -hmm. which are also brand new. We have never had anything like that. People are understandably a little bit freaking out about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, we're relying a lot on our our, our colleagues in Europe who've been uh, yeah. subject to disclosure laws for a number of years. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've done some programs with some uh, bar associations in Europe uh, just on these issues. Kind of talking. Yeah. About. Totally. And I guess the thing I didn't answer was um, the U.S. And, and embodied carbon. And yeah, why is the U.S. leading in that space? I don't really know why, but I can tell you how. How I guess it's because yeah. um, we, I think we've got really focused on it, and so like. Um, for example, when I drafted the embodied carbon, or you know, helped transpose it is the word that we're using here to us. I've talked to probably five or seven embodied carbon technical experts here to help me understand the issues because it is really kind of difficult to wrap your head around. This gets into a lot of scope three conversations, like how far was this shipped? What's the extraction impact? Looking all the way to the through the life cycle to demolition or use of a product, a building product in particular. And so uh, it's just a really technical field. And I also think for some reason, folks just think it's really interesting because it's a little bit nerdy. And mm -hmm. I say I say this as a nerd and we've also developed some cool technology. Like I just happen to also teach here at the University of Washington. And there's a something called the Carbon Leadership Forum, which is kind of a joint project involving Skanska Construction, University of Washington and probably other partners that I can't name off the top of my head. But um, the Carbon Leadership Forum is all about exactly what the name implies, taking a leadership role in carbon. And then there's other tools that have been developed like EC3, which is the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator. <laughs> and there's, so there's lots of tools and experts, I think kind of coming out of particularly the Pacific Northwest because third party certification programs like the Living Building Challenge and others have kind of driven these conversations that we've got to understand the carbon impacts of these products. So we got to develop the technology and the expertise to support it. Um, so it, for whatever reason, it's definitely become a technical area of expertise. Um, and, and, and it it's good to have lawyers like you that have the technical background. Like I understand you do, you consult a little bit as well because you have all of this great experience of consulting. So you have this technical capability and then you have the kind of legal competency proficiency and you can merge those two fields. I think a lot of times 
when we find lawyers that are focusing on these ESG issues, one of their skills is that they have this background and this underlying knowledge set that gives that informs their legal analysis. And certainly the things to do with ESG. Yeah, I mean, I think I am one of the few folks who has as much, you know, sustainable design, construction, development expertise, uh, as well as legal experience in both of those spaces. And I guess one of the things that I do advocate for, and we, we discussed this, but just to bring it up again, is you know, I think lawyers need to get comfortable hiring other lawyers, um, whether that's in-house counsel um, mm-hmm. or, you know, I know a lot of firms are setting up ESG practice groups. I have a lot of feelings on that, um, but I think, you know, lawyers kind of for their own uh, competence and other ethical obligations, I actually just did a presentation for our state part here on this, um, you know, need to understand that they don't know everything. And, mm. you know, like I said, I consulted with like five or literally, I think seven other like embodied carbon experts who've done advocacy and written policy and, you know, are technical experts just to transpose one pretty short clause, um, you know, and so like having an understanding of how technical these issues are, because I have seen contracts that are less than artful and use terms like green or green building and please, we have moved so far beyond that. And, and you're, pu- you're putting your clients at risk if you don't kind of have an understanding of how Because it's so amorphous, you might as well just say good or, you know. Oh, yeah, and even that. I mean, and I use the example, I do a lot of, you know, presentations and speaking engagements. I have a fly that is a building that has been painted green. And I'm like, this is a green building. And I'm, I'm trying to be like cheeky about yeah. this, but yeah. also like from a contractual standpoint, if you deliver that, you're not wrong, you know? And so mm. we need to, God, could you imagine having that litigation? <laughs> the green <laughs> building litigation. There are some early cases where contractors, for example, agreed to deliver a green building. And and boy, uh, mm. you know. Yeah. So anyway, but I mean, the, the lessons learned in best practice now is saying is, is lawyers getting comfortable and saying, you know, and that's why I was, you know, in addition to just, you know, talking with you, I'm interested in making these types of appearances because I think it is important for folks to be like, hey, there are people out there who are experts in this space and no, we're not going to steal your clients. And, you know, yeah. more lawyers in the room mer- rarely makes things easier. But I think all lawyers have to learn to collaborate, particularly in a time of a climate crisis. And I realize that's a little bit of a soapbox for, you know, kind of like, let's all hug moment. But, you know, the immediacy of the climate crisis and how it's impacting literally every industry, including the legal industry, because I also talk to law firms who are getting ESG requests. We probably covered this on on prior episodes, right? Lawyers and law firms also need to get smart on their own operations. And I've helped law firms think about where they're going to lease new office space for all of the reasons that we just described, because Mm -hmm. it actually impacts their clients' ESG reporting because lawyers and law firms are scope three, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and there's only a few areas that law firms can kind of address to kind of deal with their their emissions targets because most of yeah. what they do is, is providing services, right? So yeah, you, it's uh, office space and travel basically are the yeah. two big ones. Yeah. yeah, no, I think about the printer paper that I use. You, know. <laughs> you should, but honestly, it's not the biggest impact that you're making. Right? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's good to know. The big well, well, litigation we do deal with a lot of paper. Yeah, that's fair. That's <laughs> fair. Um, and you know, um, you look at firm size, but. We well, could all going, that. going back to that point, I think it's also a testament to kind of the late, the newer generation of lawyers like you yeah. and I, who are a bit more comfortable working at a smaller, you know, 10, 10, 20 years ago, we would have naturally been working at larger firms. So we would have been in a larger kind of superstructure firms. And so we would have been that resource that somebody might have called upon within the firm. Now that right. we're, we're, you know, different satellites, even though we're in our dis- distinct own firms, we can still use each other's resources collaborate and things like that. It's just you don't you just don't have to have the partnership superstructure to collaborate. A hundred percent. And I think like I said, the you know, I think it's not news that the legal industry needs to evolve. <laughs> and you know, com- there's lots of commentary on billable hour and how firms are structured and associates versus partners and all that kind of thing. And I think, you know, folks like us who I can say, all right, I'm a specialist in this area. Um, this is my rate. I'm gonna drop in for this portion of the work and give you the information that you need to help your client make a good decision and then um going to leave and mm-hmm. that kind of you know expertise is i think i think about it like when i was practicing construction law um you know we would often hire um construction experts engineers yeah. accountants yeah. for some of the delay claims and things like yeah. that and lawyers are very comfortable maybe not very but they're comfortable doing that and they, they recognize that they need to do that right i was not i'm not an accountant when i was trying to figure out the impacts of a delay claim right i need somebody yeah. to help me with that similarly 
and this goes back to what we said earlier about this whole like voluntary and regulated space that's changing so quickly. Like I can't even, as I sit here and name all the states that have building performance, you know, standards. And this is what I do every day because literally, like I said, Seattle implemented one less than a month ago. And so, you know, these things are changing so rapidly. And when we talk about things like even like leases, you know, there's, there is no precedent for a lease that manages this type of hugely important regulatory framework that now overlays the built environment, right? And and no other, I, I tell clients a lot of times when they're like trying to understand if they need to hire me or not, I'm like 99% of leases were written at a time that didn't even contemplate building performance standards or SB 253, which does impact leases because the TI example I gave earlier. And so like your the contract that literally governs your multiple millions of dollars was doesn't even contemplate this huge regulatory thing that was just dropped down in the middle of it. And your lease is going to last longer than that. Mm. And then when we look at even broader issues, California is a great example of this. You know, we're talking about energy performance. Building performance standards can apply to anything that can be measured. So water is the next thing that is going to come. And so if I'm talking to clients about you know, building performance standards from an energy standpoint, I'm saying you got to be thinking about water and how much water your building is using and being water efficient and, and managing that through your lease structure because that is that is coming. Well, th and this is something I, I, I speak about a lot is that you want to hire professionals that are really focused on these issues, not only because of their knowledge of the existing laws, but their ability to predict where the laws are going to be in five years, so the ability to help you manage potential risks going forward. Totally. And I think a great building performance standards are a great example of this because I've been working in this space for a long time and, and how you set these targets for how the buildings have to perform that was established through energy benchmarking and disclosure ordinances, which is a whole nother thing, but it's basically just saying, you know, five or so 10 years ago, buildings had the first piece of this legislation was saying, okay, you've got to at least record and report mm -hmm. your energy. Yeah. Yes. I'm over, oversimplifying here, but but yeah. The whole reason is you've got to get that data pool to be able to like, is this even feasible, right? Because if we said all buildings right now need to move to net zero, th the feasibility of that right now is not there. We need to get there and we're going to get there, but these are steps on the way, right? And so you know, somebody like me and others who've been working in this space that long, I can look back at that historical, like how has this gone to predict where it's going to go? And you know, I always tell people this too, like if a consultant, a lawyer or anyone else tells you that they know exactly how things are going to shake out, you should run away from those people, right? Um, first of all, we never warrant or guarantee our work. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I think there are some consultants and others out there who are saying, yeah, this is how this is going to go. And the world's on fire. Uh, you know, everything's changing. And you know, I think there's a lot of stress and anxiety around SB 253 and what your uh, what CARB is going to do with, through that rulemaking process. But uh, you know, folks can kind of help understand where things are going to go and and have those bigger picture strategic conversations. And that's definitely kind of the sweet spot where people like me um, can help and, and really need to be brought in. We are working lawyers, so we, ha we have to get back to work at some point. Yes. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about any um, anything you're currently writing or thinking about writing. And then, and I also wanted to ask you about kind of where you see the future. But first, tell me a little bit, are there any articles you're working on or anything kind of interesting? Yeah, for the most part, the um, stuff that I work on and write is on my firm's blog, which I'm assuming there's going to be a link somewhere to share that. So we'll yep. share that. There'll be a link in the show notes, yeah. Cool. So we'll um, share that. I do most of my stuff there, um, do quite a bit of speaking engagements. Um, so those are always really fun. Like I've mentioned, Mass Timber, I'll be speaking at the Mass Timber Conference in Portland in a couple of weeks. And then um, hopefully going to be making some other speaking engagements. Um, but if folks want to find more about, uh, you know, we give a lot of stuff away for free. Uh, our blog is a good place to do that. Um, as well as following me on LinkedIn. And then our firm is on Instagram and other kind of social media channels as well. Oh, that's good. That's you're you're really on it. I, I set up a Twitter <laughs> account for my firm that I probably posted right. on twice. Like I just can't do it. There's too many social media platforms. And there then, are too many. Yeah. Um, and then um, where do you see uh what do you see some developments? I think we've kind of talked about this throughout, yeah. but I guess is, is there, are there any specific areas you think might be interesting? Um, I think you know, this conversation about sustainability moving from this very voluntary space to regulated is going to continue. Um, so I, I guess I see that, you know, folks are waiting, on what's the SEC going to do? Um, yeah. yeah. My, my, my position is it doesn't matter what the SEC does because the market's going to demand a higher um, standard. It already is. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not SEC is going to mandate scope three and California just leapfrogged over that with 
SB253, so many acronyms. I annoy myself sometimes, but people know I'm talking about. I, I think our audience should be pretty, I think our audience understands what SB253 is. I think they understand what scope three emissions being, you know, not necessarily direct emissions, not within your first scope or second scope or third scope. I, right. I think they're pretty good on those, but yeah, you know, you're fine. Yeah, I was like, I haven't had enough coffee to explain scope scope one, two, and three, but um, I think you you hit it there. But I think this this increasing regulatory focus is going to continue um, contemporaneously with with market demand, and so um, you know that just presents a lot of opportunity for lawyers. But I think it also mandates this mind shift that we've been talking about, which is a more collaborative approach and a more letting go of like white knuckle holds on these kind of like I gotta I gotta do it all. I gotta know everything. There's a lot of generalist lawyers out there, and they're great uh, for a lot of things. Um, but but learning and knowing when to bring in experts, I think, is an increasing conversation around competency and and something that needs to 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 continue. And so and and I guess with respect to ESG, you know, uh, people have already, I'm assuming, also heard a lot of the ESG backlash and that kind of thing. And and I think you know, future looking. Again, it doesn't matter what we call ESG. It doesn't matter if if we call it something else, if it goes away, if people keep complaining about it, it's the cost of doing business. And we all companies have to do better on E, S, and G in order to survive. Um, and so I think that's that's kind of the future that I see in the way that I talk to my clients about when they're like, what, a, what about the SEC? And I heard this ESG backlash thing and I heard XYZ term that I'm not gonna repeat here, apply to that. And I'm like, you know, quite frankly, you got to do better on all of these things. The cost of business is increasing. Your insurance rates have never gone down. They're certainly not going to go down now because there's so much risk out there. Um, so start trying to manage some of those risks and costs through operating your business in, in a better way on E, S, and G factors. And I think that's the best way to kind of try to survive whatever is coming next. Not to break well, it down. I, yeah, no, no. I think I, it's not, that sounded foreboding, but I think it was hopeful in a sense. But, uh... That, I think yeah. that at the end of the day, companies are just going to have to shift gears a little bit about how, how they address these the different uh, challenges related to their social and environmental externalities. 100%. And, and you know, like I said, said jokingly, but it is true. More lawyers in the room really makes things easier. And I think it's our job to turn that conversation around and be like, I'm here to help solve problems. I'm yeah. here to work together with your business units. I'm here to understand how your business, I'm not here to drive up litigation costs. I'm not here to whine about what ESG may or may not look like. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a hall monitor to always telling you, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this because no. of this law and this law, because then you get drowned out by business owners who think, well, all you are is a stop sign for me. So it's, I'm going to have to just you know, not listen to you half of the time we talk because all you're doing is telling me not to do something. You have to be a problem solver and say, these are the constraints you have and this is how you address them. I think that's also part of being competent, but you know, an expert practitioner in the field is not only knowing what the constraints are, but how to overcome those constraints. Yeah, and understanding where things are going. You know, I think if folks are saying, you know, don't do this, or I, I hear a lot of wait for the lawsuits, um, you know, because these building performance standards are the things that are going to be struck down. Um, you know, I think that's just not great advice. And also the there was one lawsuit brought against local law 97 in New York, and um it was it didn't win. So the law stands. Yeah. And so, you know, as far as the precedent that does exist, um climate and climate disclosure and climate management and climate mitigation laws and regulations are just going to become the norm. And so, um, you know, you kind of need to just start planning ahead for that. Or uh, if you're planning now, you're a little bit behind, but just get going. Yeah. The trend line's going one way, whether, you know, right. the angle of its, of its ascent might be, you know, slowed at certain stages, but we know where it's going. So let's, let, let me just say, thank you very much for coming on today. Um, I, at first, when I when I thought about doing this show, I wasn't sure that it was going to be that it was, I thought it might be too restrictive and too niche. But it's actually been really, really interesting. I've actually learned a lot. So I'm really glad you came on today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm always. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It's it's my you know pleasure and privilege to be able to share the things that I've learned. Also do a lot of mentoring folks. You know, I think there's a lot of conversation if anybody's on LinkedIn about like, what do I do next? How do I work in climate? Um, there's a lot of opportunity to do that. It's just a matter of kind of finding your niche and um, kind of going from there. So yeah, thanks for the chance to share with your audience. I hope it was helpful. Thanks so much. Uh, you have a great rest of your day. Bye. Take care.